RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello Cave Dwellers, welcome to the cave. Today it's the turn of the Apple Macintosh PowerBook 160. This arrived in the cave during our last donations video and you'll recall it has a great big crack across the screen. Aside from that crack, it seems to work okay. You turn it on, it chimes, an image appears. So um, I think we can get it working thanks to this donation which arrived recently. This is the same model but it's been pretty much stripped out um, of hard drives and batteries and other parts. I don't know what else remains in there but crucially the screen looks to be intact. So I'm hoping that we can smush the two together and come up with a working PowerBook 160. If the screen doesn't work, perhaps we'll need to recap one of the boards or the inverter board, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. If we're lucky, it will be a straight swap out. And while we're doing that, we can learn a little bit of history about the Apple Macintosh PowerBook, because the range is essentially Apple's first ever laptop range. It did have a portable computer before the PowerBook, but that's really classed as a luggable, it's not really a laptop. So this 160 was later in the range, but it is part of that initial range of Apple laptops. The first one coming out in 1991, and the range continued, although it dropped the Macintosh from the PowerBook name through to 2006. So a 14 year legacy this leaves. So there's lots to talk about while we repair it, but there's also lots of work to do to repair it. So let's take it over to the lab. Let's strip them down and let's see if we can get a working Apple Macintosh PowerBook. So let's start by stripping our donor laptop of any useful looking parts, including that screen. One difference between our machines is that the donor has the rear flap, a part that's commonly lost or broken because it's not especially well made, and it gets a lot of use to access the power button which is located on the back there. There's just a thin bit of metal poking out of either end of the flap, which slots into a plastic hole on the case. And on one side, the plastic has broken and the metal has completely gone. And problems with plastics is a theme that will run throughout this video, as you'll see. From a design perspective, it's not an unpleasant machine to look at, but it's not especially inspiring. The range drew on Apple's Snow White design language, which it applied to its machines from around 1984 through to the early 90s. But this one adopted a darker colour scheme for a more corporate look, and a series of ridges mimicking the indentation lines of their desktop range. Let's open it up then, and the eagle-eyed will see a large crack in the plastic near the floppy drive there. And as we come to the rear screw, the plastic has cracked around the screw itself. If you're working on these, then never over-tighten the screws. The brittle plastics just can't take it. I can also see that we have the optional modem inside here. There's usually a blanking plate where the RJ11 port is on ours, and perhaps we'll find some further upgrades inside. That could be a good indicator. Getting into the machine is fairly straightforward with just one interconnect cable to unhitch inside before fully opening it up. Although in this instance, it's already detached. You can see it down here. Normally you just slide your finger in and pop that out. There's the socket nestled in there. And there they are. I think we'll salvage parts from the bottom half first and I can immediately see something of interest. This is a memory expansion, and from the looks of things, it's an additional 2 megabytes to complement the stock 4 megabytes of RAM, which is soldered directly on board. So that's definitely a keeper. The machine could be upgraded to 14 megabytes according to the manual, which was pretty hefty for 92. The machine comprises of a daughter board and main system board, and as I remove the daughter board here, Brittle Plastics raises its ugly head again. One of the screws won't release from the standoff, when we take a closer look, we can see that that standoff sits here, going through a hole into the system board, where it should be anchored to the case. However, when we take a closer look, the metal standoff is mounted in a plastic mount, which, like the other plastics we've seen, is incredibly brittle. One turn of the screw, and the whole mount just shatters. I really hope our other case isn't quite so bad, otherwise we'll need to reach for the super glue. October 1992 is when the 160 model here was released, 
and that's a significant month for some viewers. I know a lot of Amiga fans watch this channel, and October 92 was the same month the Amiga 1200 was launched. Oh, and there's evidence there of a battery leak. Um, perhaps that explains the crack on the underside of the case, because if the batteries bulged inside the bay, then it would have stressed it, and again, those brittle plastics may have suffered. Anyway, going back to the A1200, as I remove the modem here, I referred to it because the PowerBook 160 houses a Motorola 68030 processor running at 25 megahertz, and that's an upgrade a stock Amiga owner would have loved at the time. And it's on a 32-bit bus. There are no bottlenecks like are found in the Apple LC1 or 2 desktops, which crippled the CPU's performance. So on the face of it, a pretty powerful little machine with a spec us Amiga fans would have been envious of in a portable package. A SCSI drive sits inside the PowerBook and attaches to this cable. Two and a half inch SCSI drives are like gold dust, and sadly there isn't one inside our donor. Up to four external SCSI devices are also supported, providing you have the proper Apple cable for it. Yes, some things never change, you need the proprietary cable. And there's another broken plastic standoff. Disassembly continues gifting us a floppy drive, and the system board itself from the bottom half of the machine. All useful items to have, and they'll go safely in my spares box. Now, let's deal with the top half. A trackball is the input device of choice, and it's easily removed. That's another useful spare. And then we'll detach the keyboard ribbon cables carefully, and unscrew, then remove the keyboard. Almost all of the screws are of the T8 Torx variety, so have that bit to hand if you're taking this job on. Then it's on to the inverter board, which houses the pots for the brightness and contrast, which are adjusted using the plastic actuators above the keyboard. We'll pop that out and keep it safe. And then there's the interconnect board in the middle, which also houses the speaker and a battery. It looks okay at the moment, but we might want to consider replacing or removing that battery in the longer term. And I also think those fold-out feet could be uh, useful to have as spares, just in case I ever snap one. So let's grab them while we can. Everything must go. Something that's distinctly absent from this design are great big metal brackets which anchor the screen to the chassis and normally offer a lot of strength and support for all of that opening and closing of the screen hinges. Not so with the PowerBook 160. Let's also grab those brightness and contrast actuators. The display hinges are mounted only to, yes you guessed it, the plastic of the top part of the case. So as we disassemble it, we want to be extra careful of those brittle plastics, as they will have suffered a lot of stress in this area. We'll detach the inverter cable, and the display cable is held inside a ferrite bead, which is stuck to the case. You can prise this off, but I felt this one was particularly stubborn, and with that brittle plastic, I chose to leave it in place and we'll just detach it from the other end, hopefully not damaging the cable in the process, because that could be a useful spare. And when we pop the screen out, there is that cable, and we can just unplug it and remove it. Job done then, right? We've got ourselves a replacement screen. Well, not quite. Take a closer look, because something nasty caught my eye. Can you see it? How about now? crusty, leaking capacitors all over the board. This isn't going to be as straightforward as I thought it was. Let's recap our display then, and fingers crossed that it works. To gain access to the caps, we'll remove the display housing, inside which we'll find the backlight, which we'll delicately remove and store safely. And that was connected to our inverter board. We can then get into the display, and if I jump to shaky hand close-up cam, you can see how crusty some of these caps are. 
there's absolutely no doubt that they are vomiting their electrolytic guts up. This apple is rotten. The danger then is that corrosion will have damaged the pad or weakened it so that it will lift up with the capacitor on removal. To minimise that danger, I first wanted to see how deep the damage is. I've applied some white vinegar to the area and let it bubble for five minutes before cleaning it off with some IPA. And then I've run a glass fibre pencil on the joint. And after a bit of work, I can see some shiny solder under there. So there is hope that this will come off nicely and it hasn't corroded all the way down to the pad. To further our chances, I dabbed some liquid flux onto the joint and then hit it with the hot air gun. Notice I've also stuck some foil down with Captain tape to avoid damaging the screen with heat and any of the other sensitive components in the area. Thankfully the caps complied and came off, although it does still look pretty nasty on that board where the leak has occurred. But after a lot more cleaning with IPA and a bit of work with solder braid, we do have plenty of pad left in that middle C4 slot to install a new capacitor. That's where I was most worried about things here. So that's a good result. Removal of the rest of them should be fairly straightforward, so let's get them all out. To install our SMD caps, I've loaded the pads with a little solder, and then I'm using my chisel tipped soldering iron just to make that solder molten and slide the capacitor in. It's a fiddly job in limited space and around sensitive components like that cable on the right hand side there. If you put the hot iron anywhere near that, you're going to cause a lot of work for yourself. A pair of tweezers really helps here to position those caps and then help them sink into the solder and hopefully sit flush with the board. These three are where the worst leakage was and they've taken to the pads really well. If you're having issues, don't make increasing the heat of the iron your first change. Just dab some flux onto the pads and usually you'll find that that gets things moving. If that's not working for you, then make sure you've got some solder on the iron just to help with the heat transfer. Although be careful not to put too much on there. These SMD caps don't need a lot of solder and you can see it's peaked a little bit on that middle pad where I dabbed it and I'll fix that later because you don't want too much solder, it can result in it making contact with the canister itself and uh, that's the last thing we want. I'm soldering here at 360 degrees C, which seems to be a good balance for this board, getting things molten fairly quickly without having to dwell too long on any one area, but not damaging the pads. And it also pays to perform a quick continuity test after fitting each one, just to make sure you haven't bridged the pads under the cap. And these are all good, so let's get on with fitting the rest. With them all in place, we can finally clean up with some IPA and you should have nice sturdy caps and shiny solder points. And somehow we did all of that without cracking the screen, but there is still time for mistakes yet. Finally, we can put the screen back together and then we can tear open our good, or hopefully good, machine and turn it into a working power book. The final thing to note when putting the screen back together is to be very cautious around cable management. The inverter cable in particular is very delicate and if you pinch it in the case, it will just slice straight through it. So follow the cable channels that are evident around the plastics and make sure everything goes back where it should. And that's our screen all ready to go into our other laptop. Now we've seen how this model is stripped and what's inside, so I won't dwell too much on laptop number two, but I was pleased to find that the plastics are in far better condition in this one. All of the standoffs for the system board are intact. And while we're just poking around in here, I will add that two megabyte RAM expansion that we salvaged. That just presses right in here. 
and we can see installed is the original 40 megabyte SCSI drive from 1992. I really hope it works, but I think the likelihood of it is pretty slim. Old hard drives are delicate enough as it is, let alone one that gets thrown around inside a laptop bag. In some rare models of the PowerBook, there is a SCSI to IDE adapter to cater for larger drives, which would be really useful to have right now, but no such luck here. If you see one of those converters, then just grab it, they're so useful. There's a two and a half inch SCSI drive on eBay right now for 600 US dollars, so um, if ours doesn't work, I think we'll be looking for modern alternatives. I just wanted to show you inside our cracked screen because we can see here the caps for comparison are shiny and they look fine, but given the track record of these screens, you should probably get to recapping them soon anyway. And there is our cracked display under there, which you can see is soldered into place with a matrix of connectors all around it. That's not something we can easily swap out. Finally, while our good laptop was stripped, I took the opportunity to clean it up with some washing up liquid and a brush to get into all of those nooks and crannies. And once it was dried, I could put it all back together. And now at last, I can show you the result and we can see if it works. So was it all worth it? Let's hit the power button and I'll show you what happens. There's the chime and then the screen does indeed come to life but it's quite hard for you to see no matter how much I move it from there. It looks quite dark on the camera uh, but it's bright to me so I'll zoom you in and try and get you a good shot of it. And you can see what it's telling us is that it can't find a disc, either a floppy disk or an internal SCSI hard drive because I've taken the hard drive out. Take a look at this. As we expected might be the case, that original 40 meg hard disk is uh, displaying the symptoms of the click of death. It's just not happy and you can see it's trying really hard to work. But when we stop it, there's actually scarring on the platter as if the arm or the head has crashed into it at some point and caused damage. So uh, I think that's beyond my skills to save. So it means we have no hard disk inside the laptop and a replacement two and a half inch SCSI hard drive is actually really, really expensive. They're really quite hard to get hold of in working condition. And if you find them, they're listed for a huge amount of money sometimes. Silly money, more than I'm prepared to spend on this thing. So to try and give you a bit of a demonstration, what I decided to do was to use the external SCSI port. I got hold of one of these cables and this in itself presented an issue. This is a HDI 30 cable. Apple branded, of course, you've got to buy the Apple cables. Now, if you look down in that cable, you'll see at your bottom right, which is pin number one, the pin has been hacked away. That was me, I cut that, cake, that, that pin. And the reason for that is Apple sell two variants of this cable. One has the pin, one doesn't. If the pin is present when you plug it in, it puts the PowerBook into SCSI disk mode. And what that means is you can plug the laptop directly into another Apple Macintosh computer and it will just act as a hard disk. It will just let you access the files. Whereas if pin one isn't there, then it operates like a normal SCSI port. You can attach your SCSI devices, such as this CD-ROM drive over here, to it. And it took me a little while to figure that out because I bought this cable just listed as a SCSI cable. Uh, and it took me a bit of research to understand why it wasn't working. Here's the screen before I cut the cable and you can see it's just saying, this is SCSI device number one, plug it in and you'll be able to use it on another Apple Mac. For a while I thought that actually meant I can't find SCSI device number one because I'd taken the hard drive out, but a little bit of research goes a long way. So just be aware of that. With the pin cut, this cable worked. So let's um, turn it off and we'll plug the cable in and we'll turn the CD-ROM drive on first and then power the power book on. And this time, with any luck, it will boot from the CD. This is Macintosh system. 7.5 over here. The system originally would have come with, I think it was system 7.1, so a newer version of the operating system. And there we go, M welcome to Macintosh. It will now load, albeit a little bit slowly because it's loading from CD-ROM. But it gets us to a point where I can say to you, look, it's working, our screen works, our trackball works, our keyboard work, everything seems to work. Our brightness and contrast sliders work. This is a good, happy, working PowerBook. The question is, what do I do about that hard drive? 
Now, there are various options that we can choose from, and I, I'm inviting your input, really, if you have any better ideas. One is to find an expensive replacement hard disk. I, I think I've already wiped that one off my list. It's just going to be too expensive. The other is to use something like this. I've dug out my SCSI to SD adapter, so that has a uh, SCSI port into an SD card. Now, this can be configured to work with it, but it's too big to fit internally. So do I just put this in an external case and have it sat next to the Macintosh uh, or on top of the CD-ROM drive and set it up that way? Um, or do you have a better idea? Not quite sure what to do with this. Um, it's a nice spec machine for a classic Apple Macintosh. And the final really nice feature about this laptop I want to tell you about is another proprietary Apple cable. If you can get hold of this, you can plug this into the back. It gives you uh, your standard of the time Apple um, 15 pin video output cable. But the nice thing about this, even though it's got a black and white screen, this, the 160 model, is the first Apple PowerBook to give a color video output from the back. So what we could do is we could have our external SD card based SCSI hard drive. We could have our color monitor sat next to it. We could have our CD-ROM sat next to it. And we could plug in a regular ADB Apple keyboard and mouse into the back. And you could have a pretty nice Apple Mac desktop PC, <laughs> albeit a laptop. My only gripe with that, it does away with the whole work of replacing the screen if we're just using an external monitor. But uh, it's nice to know that those features are there. It's possible to do that. And um, in actual fact, the repair here has been successful, except for the hard disk. So let me know what you think in the comments. I'm happy with the work that's done today, and I'm happy to have one working PowerBook 160 instead of two broken PowerBooks. As always, thank you for taking the time to watch. I hope you found it useful and maybe picked up a few tips along the way. And I look forward to hearing your tips on how I can make this better. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. If you enjoy my content and would like to support the cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.